Hello, everybody. Welcome back to St. Matthew's Church in Glendale, California, as we continue our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 still. Uh, for those of you who were watching for last week's segment, sorry that did not show up. Uh, the computer memory was full and it just simply wouldn't record, but that seems to be okay now. And so we're going to continue in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'm going to go back a few verses. Paul's tried to deal with this little controversy that's happening in the church in Corinth that people are kind of choosing sides and who they're going to follow and are they more attracted to Paul's preaching style, which is kind of simple and logical but deep, or some are following after uh, Apollos because he's more eloquent, some are following after Peter because he's more traditionally Jewish. It's not that they... Uh, it's not that they are not following the same faith. These are all people within the household of the church. It's just they're starting to choose factions, and that's causing dissent. And so I'm going to start reading here from verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will thwart. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Greeks, to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Why don't we start, Pam, if you then would read verse 26. Okay. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influ influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. Behold, he says, think of what you were when you were called. This calling is something internal. Think of this internal connection with God, this internal calling of God, not based on any external conditions, but solely based on God's love and grace, that God in grace chose to call you. Now, if you think back a few weeks to what I said about Corinth, Corinth is one of the more influential cities in the Greco-Roman world at that time. It's an important shipping city. It tends to be much wealthier. The people there are probably actually more well-heeled, we might say, than many of the people that Paul writes to in his other letters. But with these people, Paul still says, not many of you were influential, not many of you were of noble birth. So apparently the people who are joining the church, or attracted to the church at least at this point, may not be the upper crust of uh, Corinth at this time, but he's also alluded to some names that were kind of influential. Why do you think he might be making this point of you weren't all that high on the list when you were called? What do you think he might be trying to say here? God accepts anybody and everybody. Absolutely. Good. Well, Jesus was not wealthy or anything like that either. Right. Very true. I mean, he certainly he probably didn't work. want him to get a big head. I think that's in there, too. These are people who maybe, because of their culture, are prone to that. And so he's kind of giving it as a warning. Don't think too highly of yourselves. Remember, you weren't the top of the top of the heap. Right. Very good. Not just many... that um, the regular person can be part of God's community, not just the leaders. Yeah, very true. So... Very true. Uh, not many of you were wise by human standards, or what other translations do you have for human standards? Worldly standards. Worldly standards? Yeah, worldly. After the flesh is the Old King James. That's the Old King James, right? It means uh, 
and that's actually the most literal. It's carta sarx, which is sarx means flesh, is after the flesh. By your own simple flesh, by your own flesh and blood body, you weren't all these things, but God called you nonetheless. What's important is that God called you as you were. It's not about the mighty people of this world, the great, the powerful, the rulers, the wealthy, the business leaders, the politicians, the influencers, they say today. It's about God calling those whom God chooses to call. Gene, verse 27, please. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. That's that paradox of God flipping everything upside down on its head. He chooses those things which seem foolish to the world to shame the wise. He chooses the things which are weak to shame the strong. I may have told you at one point the story that uh, when Paul goes to preach in Athens, and when he starts to talk about a physical resurrection of Jesus, most of the people just scoff and walk off. They're too wise to believe something like that could happen. That's how God's wisdom is even higher. God has a picture in mind and God has, has a plan in mind which the human mind cannot accept. And that's why the words show up like the scandal of the cross or the stumbling block of the cross. It's a stumbling block to the wise. Those who want to try and come up with a scientific definition, you won't. There is some degree to which it is faith. Now, we can look at archaeology and history, and we can see some things of the Bible and say, oh yeah, well, you can trace this through here. But you certainly can't prove the divinity of Jesus from history or from archaeology. Ultimately, that becomes a matter of faith. There's, uh, we talk about uh, in the Middle Ages, they used to debate the origins of the earth. And can you really prove that God created everything? Well, there are proofs. There's natural revelation in creation. But ultimately, it kind of is a matter of whether or not you believe God did this or not. And how God did, did that's a separate question. But ultimately, you can't prove the existence of God. But God calls us. The Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth. I cannot by my own reason or strength come to my Lord Jesus or believe in him, but the Holy Spirit calls me. That's all the things that Paul is getting at here. The message of the cross does not make sense in the world's standards. The fact that the king of the universe would allow himself to be killed in a brutal way does not make sense by worldly standards, but God turns everything upside down. And he continues that thought in 28, Judy H, please. <clears throat> God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. That's what, do you have other translations for bring to nothing? Nullify. 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 That's a good one. Mere Th nothings. Mere nothings. Think about that. The lowly things of this world, the despised things, are going to bring all those things which seem so important to naught. What was that? Do uh, you remember the old Beverly Hillbillies where Jethro wanted to be? It was the time when James Bond films were starting to get popular in the late 60s. And Jethro wanted to be a not not spy. Instead of a 007, he was going to be not not. That's kind of the word here to be, it's nothing, it's a complete zero. God is going to make all those things zero in comparison. It can be the common labor, the simple worker, it's the poor, the homeless, the hungry, the child, the aged, the person with a terrible disease, a person with a disability. God takes those people and he lifts them up against the things of this world. Those who might be rejected by the world are those that God very often calls. So that, verse 29, Carol, please. Um, that no flesh should glorify, I'm sorry, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Or no one can boast, we might translate it. Boast, Why does yeah. God choose these simple things? So that we can boast, so that we cannot boast. For by grace you have been saved. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. God does everything. We can't do it. He calls us. Um, we got uh, Diane. You want to read 30, please? 
It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. We are. God has chosen us to be in Christ. Christ, who is this wisdom from God that if you know the uh, anybody named Sophie, Sophia, it's that word here, this this wisdom of God or anybody who been to, I have not been, but if you've been to Istanbul to the great church there, the, the Hagia Sophia, it's that, oh yeah, Judy, you've been there, the Hagia Sophia. Uh, that's where it's Jesus, the wisdom of God. It comes from this word, verse, the wisdom from God. Therefore, 31, Dennis, please. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And he's kind of picking up a snippet there from Jeremiah chapter 9. If you're going to boast, there's only one thing to boast in, and that's God who called you. Because of ourselves, we have nothing to brag about. We didn't create the faith. We didn't call ourselves. God called us. God created the faith in us through the Holy Spirit. And it's only in God that we can boast. God sent Jesus to earth to be God's revelation because God wanted humanity to be able to see God face to face. God reveals himself to man in the person of Jesus Christ. It's not something we do. It's not something we can achieve. It's not something that we can lift ourselves up to. It's totally by the grace of God. Okay, that's chapter one. Questions on chapter one. I guess we're ready to move on to chapter two. Chapter two, verse one, Carolyn, please. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God in lofty words or wisdom. Now, put this in context of what we read a couple weeks ago about this, the, these divisions that are forming. And some people are knocking Paul. And one of the things they're knocking him is he's kind of this, from what we can, at least what we can glean, he's probably this short bow-legged guy who who really knows his stuff he he truly knows the law he gives uh great teaching but he's not super eloquent he's not trying to use all kinds of eloquent or sophistry we might say all these uh incredible arguments not with excellency of speech or wisdom uh the word there is not with wisdom or speech which is rising above everybody else i'm not trying to be preeminent um uh, he, the word he uses here is a word that's used in ancient Greece for people who are persons of position, persons who are, we might say, the hoi polloi, which is completely wrong in Greek, but you know that phrase? We sometimes use the hoi polloi for the top. Hoi polloi actually means the people. It's the exact opposite. How that in English usage came to be the top of the heap, I don't know. But so that would be that kind of uh, the hoi polloi or... Uh, cream of the crop, the, the leaders in town. I didn't come like anything like that. I simply came to, to proclaim to you the, and you'll bet you have different translations here, to proclaim what? Testimony, mystery. <laughs> Testimony, mystery. That's actually the reason some of your Bibles have different words is because we do have Somebody along the way made a transcription error, error, and we're not really sure whether they meant to say Mysterion or Martion. Doesn't much matter. But some monk somewhere made a mistake that got copied down in a few places. So some Bibles go with the mystery of God and some with go with the martyr of God or the testimony of God. Both are true, though. Verse 2, Dalton. I resolved that while... I, I was with you. I would not claim to know anything but Jesus Christ. Christ nailed to the cross. When Paul was there with them, he wasn't trying to show off himself. He wasn't trying to better himself or lift himself up. He was there living in Corinth for one purpose, and that was to proclaim Christ and Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins. Verse 3, Judy D. Please. And I was with you in weakness and in much fear and trembling. Not with all kinds of cleverness, not with all kinds of 
grandiose ideas, not trying to lift himself up. He actually had fear and trembling. And this probably goes back to that little bit that we have from some records of he's probably somebody who's kind of short, kind of bow-legged, not somebody that people are going to be naturally drawn to as far as no natural charisma. He had some sort of physical infirmity, and we've debated what that might be, and scholars debate all the time, but we don't really know. But he's probably somebody who had quite a few weaknesses, and yet his whole presence was about preaching Christ. But that's in Corinth. It was one thing for him to do that in certain cities, but he probably was feeling even more intimidated going into a city like Corinth, where it meant so much. Uh, might think of Hollywood or Las Vegas as, you know, uh, it's so much more important how you look and how you're seen by people and being the proper, all of, you know, whatever you're going to look like. Those things were true of Corinth. And so he came in as this simple, humble guy. He probably gave him more consternation, more fear and trembling of how he would be received because he was preaching an idea which was against everything that they had taught, been taught. He was preaching an idea that didn't make sense by the world's sense of wisdom. And he wasn't the most impressive character, but he was still preaching the truth. And the Holy Spirit was working through everything he said and did to bring people to faith. Because the calling is from God, not from within ourselves. Uh, is that Mike's shoulder? Sure, yes. <laughs> okay. Mike, we're in chapter 2. You want to read verse 4? Uh, let me see. Go oh, ahead. Yeah, I got to get focused here. I don't have much light. Okay. How about Carol? You want to go with 2 4, please? You say me again? Carol, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Here he's using the spirit. This it's, it's internal. It's about, it's not about having the great eloquence. It's not about the great persuasive words, but the spirit working inside. Now also try to put this in context of Greco Roman culture. If any of you took a speech class, maybe in college or maybe in high school, your teacher got it a little bit into uh, Aristotle and the forms of debate and the forms of persuasion often that was part of Greek culture how the powers of persuasion we might say today but with uh, in in the greco-roman world there were there were different ways different different uh, different avenues we might say or different uh, types of ways to influence people um, to persuade people Paul says I didn't use any of that I didn't have any of that behind me. All I did was preach the truth because the Spirit was working through the truth. I didn't have to use flowery language. It wasn't about that. It was about the Spirit speaking the truth. He says it can be translated, I wasn't doing anything that was enticing, meaning that persuasiveness. Uh, it, it almost wasn't plausible, he says, by human standards. And yet there was a demonstration of the Spirit's power because the Spirit was working within you. Paul was absolutely convinced that it wasn't about his keen intellect or speaking ability. It was about the Holy Spirit working through God's word. And we say from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew scripture, God's word never returns void. It always accomplishes that which God purposes for it. We may not always see it. We may not always understand it. It may not have the effect we want to see it have at the moment. But God's word is always active, always does something. Verse 5, Judy H. That your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So Paul probably was a brilliant scholar. We're pretty convinced that. He certainly was schooled in the law. He had had a first-class education for a Jewish male living in the Gentile world of that time. And yet he wasn't trying to use that sophistry. He was simply preaching, and faith was being created by the word because it was about God's power not about Paul. Gene, verse 6. Yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age 
who are doomed to, to perish. <clears throat> yeah, he says it's not like this is all bunk or nothing. And he, another, we hear about getting from spiritual milk onto solid food. This is kind of in line with that. This wisdom does have a certain level of maturity and we mature in this wisdom, but it's not the wisdom of this world or this age, it, it uh, actually says. It's not from this eon, it literally says. It's not from this eon, it's not from this world, it's not from this time. Those are all fleeting. This time will pass, this world will pass. This wisdom is from God and it is eternal. All those others will come to, and here's the word again, not this nullification of all of those things which will all come to an end and which have no eternal presence. Uh, Pam, verse 7. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Secret wisdom is the NIV. What other translations do you have? Hidden. Hidden wisdom. I, I use the NIV. That's what I've got in my notes here. And so it kind of stood out to me. I, I don't like how they translated it here. Uh, secret wisdom might kind of sound like what group? Gnostics. Yeah, it sounds awfully Gnostic, yeah, and I'm not sure why 70 scholars working on the NIV didn't didn't pick up on, it kind of echoes that. That's not what he's saying here at all. Hidden is probably better. It's it's really just about a mystery. It, that's the best way to translate it. It's Mysterio. It would be better to say, no, we speak of God's mystery, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before the world began, or that God foreordained even before creation, before the worlds were, God had already called us and chose us and said that we would be receiving this truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That kind of begs the question of, well, why some and not others? That's an old question that scholars debated in the church. In Latin, it's cur ali ali non. Why does God choose some and not others? And Luther's famous answer to that was, anybody know? I don't know. The Bible doesn't answer. <laughs> Luther said the Bible clearly says some people are foreordained. Not everybody is. It doesn't say that God doesn't does disordain anybody it simply says some people are called and it doesn't answer what about everybody else and so luther just let scripture stand and said i don't know so but somehow before the world was created god had had foreordained to reveal this knowledge to reveal the gospel to some this mystery that was previously hidden would be the best way to translate it verse eight uh back to diane None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Paul seems to be kind of echoing, he wasn't there for it, but he seems to be using much the same idea as Peter's sermon on Pentecost. You remember when Peter's preaching, when the Spirit has come on the disciples, and Peter's kind of like, they didn't know who they were killing. Uh, I mean, I almost want to say he kind of gives a pass to the crowd. That's not really what it is. Remember, the crowd on Pentecost is all kinds of people from all over the Roman world at the time. So of the, uh, the throngs of people in the city, most of them weren't there 50 days plus before for the crucifixion. They had no part in it. But Paul says, you know, or Peter says in his, his sermon that the people didn't know who they were putting to death. This was the Lord of glory. And Paul picks up on that again here. The rulers of this age didn't understand it. If they realized who they were facing, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Now that's probably true in some ways. In some ways, he's also probably being a little bit complimentary. I'm not so sure that there aren't some rulers who would do anything to stamp out the one who would be the Lord of glory. Can you think of something from early in the Gospels where that seems to be exactly what happened? Pilate. Yeah. Pilate may have. He doesn't, you know, he may be looking at this guy as just this wandering, who knows. But somebody else probably had a better reason to believe that this might be the one and decided to try to stop him up. 
stamp them out. Herod. Herod, yeah. So I, I think Paul is kind of given a pass here. I think Herod had good reason to think that this was the one and thought that he would cancel God's plans on him, which didn't go so well for Herod. Uh, let's see. Let's, uh, let's stop there. And then let's do nine. Was that Diane, Dennis, you want to read nine? However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived, but God has prepared for those who love him. This is one of the most beautiful Pauline quotes that he pulls us together. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. It's not clear where Paul is quoting this from. He may be taking a whole bunch of different stuff in Isaiah and kind of mushing it together to come up with this. It's a beautiful line, but we don't know the exact source of this quotation. But it's certainly true that the glories of heaven, if you were at St. Matthew's this morning, I was kind of talking about the imagery. The Bible uses imagery to try to get some glimpse of what heaven is to us but it's so far beyond our comprehension that it can only be imagery because we can't even conceive. Streets of gold, gates of pearl, all that's imagery to try to communicate how glorious and wonderful this is. But- Pastor, the, uh, the Jerusalem Bible has a footnote saying it is a, uh, that last quote, a free combination of Isaiah 64, three and Jeremiah three sixteen. Oh, they're pulling Jeremiah. Ah, I've got three different citations in Isaiah that that my like commentary Isaiah thought they pulled together. Four. What was that, Gene? Well, mine was Isaiah sixty-four four. Yeah, he mine, seems okay. to be seems to be so free, free flowing. Free, what was free your combination? Looks like you translated. Yeah, very loose translation. Uh, uh, Mike, what's your Jeremiah citation there? I want to look there. Uh, if Jr. is Jeremiah, I believe three sixteen. Three sixteen. Okay, good. Okay, I think we'll stop there. We'll actually come back to verse 9 because it kind of breaks between 9 and 10 next week. But we have maybe a minute or so for questions before we pray. I've got some notes here, just some marginal conversational notes that, uh, can you look back? Yeah. That uh, back right before I came in, the first couple of verses of the chapter uh, where it seems like Paul's central theme is arguing against this passionless uh, theology, passionless wisdom, passionless writings, um, like the like the Q document, not Q anon, but Q quella, right, right. the missing that fifth gospel uh, that had to do a lot with uh, wisdom literature, which we had, and you get that repetition at least in my version, at least four or five wisdom, 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 wisdom. Oh yeah, he definitely is using it over and over and over. He seems to be attacking that sophistry of the age but the passionless that's interesting where they're i wonder where that's that it was just all mind games and not maybe that's what it's trying to get at with in your note there yeah that, well this is this is a uh, conversation on notes from previous classes right right, right. Uh, Jerusalem. but i've got another one on the side it says uh, against the uh, the greek endless debates and hair splitting <laughs> leading to uh reason and wisdom that like gnosis of uh, the gnostic gospels gnosis and sophia you know that whole argument uh, that just how many angels can dance on the you know, end of a pen etc that's exactly where i was gonna go yeah people could get wrapped up in debating the mundane yeah. yeah okay i see people are starting to disappear on us and it is about one so thank you mike let's close in prayer do we have bible study next week uh you're gonna have prayer time with terry Okay. We bow our heads in humble prayer before the Lord as we humbly remember those who are, have gone before us. That all who have died in faith joyously enter the glory of eternal life, we pray to God, God, God receive our prayer. prayer. We pray that those who grieve may find support in their time of need. We pray to God, God, God receive our, our prayer. prayer. We pray that those who do not believe in God may come to know the hope that belief in Jesus brings. We pray to God, God, God receive our prayer. prayer. We pray that those who suffer from depression or anxiety may experience God's merciful comfort and receive the help that they need. We pray to God, 
God, God our prayer. And we pray that those who are lonely may find hope for a new life. We pray to God, 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 our prayer. God of mercy, hear our prayers for those we love who have left this world in faith. May they and all the faithful departed through your mercy truly rest in peace. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, blessed all saints Sunday. God bless everyone. A moment to say goodbye. God bless you. Bye. God bless all. Everybody have a good week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.